Thank you all for coming tonight to this uh, episode, I should say, of Henderson Speaks. I want to welcome you on behalf of the Henderson Historical Society. I am doing the president's work tonight because he didn't want to jump up here, run over, and then run back. Uh, looks bad. You know, he doesn't want to show off his natural running ability. Um, so <laughs> he did enough of that when he was, well, being mayor, I suppose. Um, so want to welcome everybody here. A couple of things I want to note, just so that everybody remembers. We're going to go through the mayors. Each one will speak uh, for a designated amount of time, just so that you understand. It is less than two hours apiece. <laughs> So we are not going to be, we will be out of here sometime before 1130. <laughs> now we, we had a meeting ahead of time to make sure of that because um, we know that no politician goes along when they're given a microphone. So we should be fine on that. Once we get through each presentation, then we will open it up for questions from the audience. Um, so hold on to your questions. Uh, at that time, I would like to make sure that all questions from the audience bounce between the back of the room and the front of the room. Because Sean is going to be running back and forth with the microphone. And he needs some more exercise. So if you can help me out with that, please try to bounce those questions back and forth so we can see how quickly he can get up and down the stairs. All right, can you work with me on that? Great, okay, that will help. Um, Henderson has a not very long history. Henderson was incorporated in 1953, got its first mayor in 1953. That was James French. Over the years, let me run through the names. Between 1953 and 1993, there were nine mayors. It was James French, William Byrne, William Hampton, Estes McDaniel, Cruz Olagi, thank you. I wanted, I knew somebody would correct me if I didn't, if I just didn't say it. Richard Stewart, Lauren Williams, Leroy Zyke, Zyke, is that correct? Okay. And Lorna Kesterson. And then in 1993, Bob Grosbeck became the mayor. After him came Jim Gibson, then Andy, then Andy Hafen, and of course our current mayor, Deborah Marsh. Before I let them speak, I'd like to point out that that first group of nine mayors covers 40 years in the history of Henderson. The four mayors that you see before you covers 28 years in the history of the community of Henderson. So that's pretty amazing and pretty interesting. And I know I am looking forward to these talks tonight. You know, even though I've retired from the museums, I have not retired from a, an interest in Henderson history. And um, I'm looking forward to maybe hearing a few tales that we might not be aware of. So we are going to go chronologically, and I'm not going to make any comments about history and the individuals. <laughs> but we are going to start with Bob Grosbeck. Bob? Thank you, Mark, and good evening, everyone. And I want to thank the uh, Henderson Historical Society for hosting this event. It's certainly nice to be back again. Um, I had the opportunity to speak over at the Gibson Library several years ago and really enjoyed that, but it's particularly uh, exciting to have my, my friends and colleagues here uh, at the Dyess. I was only four years of that, 28 years, by the way. <laughs> so um, <laughs> if you saw the picture up on the screen earlier, it's pretty clear that I had quite a bit more hair and um, yeah, I had a different look. But uh, I didn't really have prepared remarks other than to just kind of tell you about my experience in this city. I, 
I grew up here, my family moved here in the mid 60s. And I love this city, I always have and I always will. It's, it's always been my home. And uh, no matter where I go, and I've been blessed to travel many places throughout the world, um, I'm still a boy from Henderson, you know, at the end of the day. And um, it really amazes me, literally every day I drive home from work, to see what has happened, you know, since I left office in 1997. And that really, to me, feels like it was 50 years ago. Um, to kind of put it in perspective, when, when my family moved here, I think the city had a little less than 15,000 people. And, um, and, and, and Deborah can correct me now, but I think the city, you're well over 300, worth th over 300,000. Yeah. So when I was elected, we had just a little over 80,000 people. And um, when I left office in 97, we had literally doubled in population in four years. So we were the fastest growing city in the United States by percentage that entire four year period. And that continued during Jim's tenure and, and I'm sure Andy's as well. As the city gets larger in population, um, that skews the numbers a bit. But it really demonstrates, you know, a lot. And, and it really, it's a fascinating uh, number when you think about that rate of growth. Because I've been to a lot of cities that have experienced similar growth patterns, um, but without the foresight, the vision, and the planning. And um, for lack of a better term, uh, those communities are a mess. And um, for instance, you see some large cities, and, and I don't want to disparage anyone from Texas or, or Houston, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a Houston story. And big city, of course, but a big city that for many years had no zoning. And you can see that when you drive through parts of the city today and what that represents. And I think they missed an opportunity early on and we were fortunate through my predecessors, um, and Mark mentioned the, the mayors that preceded us, and the councils um, to really make a statement, you know, where we wanted to go as a community. Uh, I don't think there's a city of this size in the country that has the type of trail system that we have, has the number of parks that we have, and that's important because it's all about quality of life and it really represents you know, what, what the city stands for. And it means a lot, I mean, because you don't see that in a lot of communities. When you're in other places and you, you see that they don't have those amenities, it really makes me um, happy when I come home and I see what we have. My wife and I, Debbie, who's here with me, and my daughters, Elizabeth and Kate, um, Debbie and I spent a great deal of time hiking, walking, biking. We've used just about every trail in the city and do so just on about a daily basis. And it's something we take for granted, but it's something that other communities couldn't ever envision having. So it's, it's special. Let me take a step back. So when I was a kid, it, Henderson was, you know, our history is a factory town. This is a, a working man's town. And it's something I'm very proud of. And I was very fortunate when I was younger, I had a chance to work in the plants. That's how I paid for college and met a lot of great friends there and really special people and really proud of them, you know, for what they built. And it's, you know, it's, it, it means a lot. And what I always found frustrating for me as a kid is Henderson was always referred to as Hooterville. For those of you who lived here for a long time, probably you remember that. And I'm going to share a little story with you. So that was a stigma that the city had, you know, the white cloud. Uh, you know, in the south end of the valley. <clears throat> and so in about 1995, those of you who've lived here for a long time, we were in a massive battle to secure resources to build more schools, you know, to provide classes and, and seats for, you know, this, this city that was literally exploding in front of us. So those battles, of course, got pretty heated and pretty contentious. And I recall distinctly, as though it were, as though it were yesterday, I was out at the uh, airport and we had a big meeting and obviously things got pretty heated. The chair called a break. So I was in the back um, getting a drink and I thought it was really kind of encapsulates how things have evolved. So a woman proceeded to approach me. She wasn't very friendly, let's just put it that way, and was really in my face pointing at me and just, you know, 
the arrogance, the audacity, who did I think I was? And her comment to me was, you know, you people in Snooterville think you're special. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, you know, that's a different spin than what I've heard my entire life. <laughs> so I'm going to take that as a compliment, and thank you. And you know, you're damned right, we fight hard for what we think we're entitled to. And uh, so that was one story of, you know, of the city and how we've evolved. And as I said earlier, uh, I think when I left office, with the population had just about doubled. And you know, there's some things that we did then that I'm very proud of today. We created the downtown redevelopment district, which now I see is, you know, is really paying big dividends. I see some really ex exciting things happening downtown. We rezoned a large portion of the city, and as Andy knows, Andy was on the council before me, um, we had large donut holes or unincorporated pockets of the county um, that were problematic for us because we didn't have any control over any of the development that would occur there or the infrastructure that was being put in place. So that allowed us to really take those tracts of land, bring them under the city's jurisdiction and really master plan. And you know, subsequent councils and Jim and Andy and, and, and Deborah, of course, have done a, a great job at backfilling that. Because another thing I want to share with you is when I was elected, for those of you that were here in town, and there's quite a few of you I can see, you remember the huge battle between Green Valley and Henderson? And my daughter Elizabeth wore a shirt today, and you'll actually see, well, you don't have to model it, but it was Green Valley and Henderson. And I remember when I was campaigning, at the time I lived in the Green Valley area, but again, I'm from Henderson. This is all Henderson to me. And this huge battle, I'd go to these neighborhood meetings and say, okay, we're going to incorporate as Green Valley. And I'd, I used to say, you know, I, I grew up here. I mean, I grew up in Henderson. I'm a Henderson guy. It's sure as hell not going to happen in the four years I'm there. Um, but it was really unique because we had a large swath of empty land, remember, between the two parts of town. And it really, it was critically important for us to put that infrastructure in place. And thank goodness we had Bruce Woodbury, a county commissioner at the time, that worked with us uh, to, to do this. And we were able to build that. And now you can't see any, any gaps now. You know you're in Henderson. Um, so I think that's pretty important. It gives you a sense of how we've grown and where we've grown. And I'll share one more story. And Mark, you can turn off the mics you know, when I run out of time here, because I will take the two hours. Um, <laughs> Lake Las Vegas and uh, Ron Bodecker, many of you probably remember Ron. Um, Ron was a really great man, a visionary in so many ways. And, and Andy, you may remember this, but Ron, I, I was new to the council. Uh, Andy had been there for a while, and it just infuriated me they called it Lake Las Vegas. I just couldn't get over that. And I was like, this is a master plan community in the city of Henderson. For goodness sakes, you can do something other than the words Las Vegas. Surely you can. And, um, you know, Ron sat down with me, and he was not a shy man. And he told me, listen, everybody in the world knows where Las Vegas is. Nobody knows where Henderson is. And he says, Bob, I, we're putting billions of dollars in capital in this project. I should be able to name the project anything I want. And words of that effect, I'm paraphrasing. And, you know, he was right. I mean, I had to, I had to pass on that one. I, to this day, I don't like it, and I live out there. Um, but I love the community. I love how it's developed. I loved how he executed on that vision. And um, it just goes to show that, you know, this city, we, we had a palette, to, you know, that, uh, uh, that we, we needed to paint. And, um, you know, my three colleagues here have done an excellent job in, in filling, filling out that palette. And, um, again, this is just a marvelous city. And, um, you know, I, I hope to have another 50 years here. So with that, uh, Mark, I'll pass. And Very good. Thank you. Um, I have a story I'm going to wait till the end to add to your comment about Green Valley, since I live there. Um, but I have since 1993. Um, Jim Gibson, who was, I guess, my boss on the county commission, before I retired from the County Museum, which is in Henderson, of course, um, or I'm sorry, of course, um, is our next speaker. 
Thank you, Mark. One thing Bob didn't mention is that in the, on the ballot in 97 was one of the most transitional and important uh, initiatives that really had come forth up, forward uh, up to that point in Henderson. It was the $54 million park bond issue. That was the first time that the city had uh, sold bonds to pay for parks. Over the years, we've renewed that um, many, many times. And, you know, I, I suspect that we've probably uh, seen a half a billion dollars or maybe a billion dollars in parks built because of it. And we, uh, so thank you very much. Andy and Bob were both on that council that supported that. My roots go back um, a long time. Uh, my grandfather was uh, recruited by the government to um, go to England to learn a process whereby they would produce uh, magnesium. <clears throat> so during the war, the Germans were uh, prevailing in the battle in the air. Their planes were lighter because they used magnesium as opposed to the, the metals we were using. Their engines were lighter because of that. Their bombs burned hotter because they used that chemical in the bombs. And so as a practical matter, it was determined that the British would steal the process from the Germans. The Americans would go to Oxford University and learn the process and learn how to build a plant and learn how to operate it and build it here in Henderson. So the BMI complex came out of that. And so dad, my grandfather recruited five other guys, there were six of them. They got on a destroyer and they uh, went over to England to uh, learn what was to be learned, that British had been efficient and they stole the stuff from the Germans. And uh, the most incredible War Department in the history of the, of the country up to that point, War Department project was the construction of the BMI complex. And uh, there were about 13,000 workers on that project. In 18 months, they, they had built the plant and they had produced and outstripped the, the uh, demand for magnesium in another 18 months and idled the plant. The bus bar and the wiring for that plant um, couldn't be done with copper, which would have been a natural way to do it. Uh, but because of the war effort, the copper wasn't available. So uh, the United States Senator at the time arranged for $32 million worth of silver bullion to be shipped to Henderson, Nevada, where it was melted and uh, used to coat the bus bar and to produce the wires and the wires in that entire plant. Everything about that plant was top flight and it was silver from Fort Knox. Um, and so I didn't, uh, I wasn't born here. I was born in, in Las Vegas, actually. When my dad got out of the Navy, uh, we moved here and he was an engineer. He'd gone to Annapolis and he owed them some time, and after uh, we finished with that, by the time I was five, I was in Henderson. And um, the things that Bob talks about are, are real. There, this, there was this, the rest of the valley was snooty about Henderson, and we heard it all the time. And those of you who are anywhere near my age experience the very same thing. Um, over the course of time, uh, my dad had served in the legislature for 30 years, so I, I was kind of around, I, maybe more than kind of around, it was around politics and I had an interest in it, but had never planned to run for local office. I thought I would do what my dad did. And Bob called me one day in uh, about 90, late 96, and he said, uh, I've decided I'm not gonna run for re-election, and I'd like you to help me find somebody suitable I'm sorry, Bob. Someone suitable who could, you know, that we might get behind to, to, to become the mayor. And so uh, Selma Bartlett and I, I called Selma, I said, Selma, why don't we work together and see if we can't find somebody? And we made appointments with a number of people. I don't remember how many, but I think there were six or seven, maybe nine on the list. And we went around to each of their offices and we, we pitched it to them. And uh, at the last visit we made, we were on our way out the door, and Selma had gone out, and I was just passing through the door, and the, the woman we were speaking with said, hey, Jim, hey, Jim, come here a minute, come here a minute. And so I turned around, and have you reconsidered? And she said, no. She said, you, 
you, you say this is such a great job, you think this would be such a fun thing to do, so why don't you do it? And I laughed, and Selma Bartlett walked back through the door and said, that is an absolutely terrific idea. And before long, it kind of seated itself in my head, and I decided to run. So thank you, Bob. <laughs> there are some things that, that are, are fun. I wish I could tell you some of the stories uh, all of us do, but too many of the people in those stories are still alive, and so <laughs> it, it wouldn't be fair to them. Uh, but um, there are a couple of things that were really um, important to me at the time, and when I see what came out of it, I had no clue where it would end up, but I was at my alma mater, I was on this committee called the President's Roundtable. And so I would be there uh, four times a year, and I would learn all about you know, research institutions and different levels of education in higher ed. And I, I was there when we discussed state colleges and the value that a state college might bring to a, a community. Well, I got everything they had, and I brought it back, and I studied it all very carefully. And then I called Chancellor Jarvis. And... Um, a woman who was on the Board of Regents, uh, Dorothy Gallagher, who was on the Board of Regents who lived in, in Elko. And um, I had a conversation with them, and they'd done the work. And so Chancellor Jarvis sent me all of the work they'd done. So I called Selma, my buddy, and I called uh, Bob Campbell. Now, there are a lot of people who've wondered where the very first meeting about Nevada State College actually happened. It happened in Bob Campbell's living room, um, and the three of us who were there were the three I just mentioned. And we talked about doing it, and uh, it wasn't long before the regent who represented Henderson found out that we, I had talked to the chancellor. I'd actually met with him at my law office in Henderson. And uh, he, he was all exercised. That should never have happened but without me being present. And, you know, it's my region district. He has no business talking to you. And uh, I said, but what are you going to do about it? I mean, you know, we think this is something that is worth doing. He said, it is not ever going to happen. We are never going to allow a state college. And so I said something I, I kind of regretted afterwards, but I, I said to him, so like, are you going to run again? Are you going to run for re-election? And, and he said, yes. And I said, we've sampled the people in Henderson. And I know that's a very large part of your district. And by a wide margin, the people in Henderson favor having a college in our city. So if you really want to win, you probably better rethink this. And then he hung up on me. And I was in the governor's, <laughs> I was in the governor's office the next week, and another member of the Board of Regents said, hey, could I talk to you for just a minute? And I said, sure. He said, uh, I got a call and I'm told you threatened uh, one of my colleagues. And, um, and it was about that way for two and a half years as we battled and battled and battled. And when the legislature finally agreed to fund us, they would not fund the startup. So we had to raise $2 million. And it had to be cash and it had to be now. And uh, I remember calling people. I don't think they'd be upset if I told you I called Cliff Finley and, and he agreed. He said, uh, it was really funny, it's like, you know, misery likes company. So he said, have you called Mary Kay Cashman yet? And I said, <laughs> I'm calling her right now. You know, I called her and, um, you know, we, we were able to round up uh, with the help of so many, uh, the $2 million before we started incurring expenses. And uh, the state, I come here, I'm so humbled that I knew something about this state college before it ever happened, yet I look around and I knew nothing. I really didn't, I didn't have the vision of what it would be as it grew along. I've, I've, I've read all the reports, all the studies, but what an incredible thing to be here. There were, there are a couple of things that were, that were really exciting. Um, West Henderson is just going crazy. Uh, uh, these two have had a hand in it, and, and Deborah most recently with some incredible stuff out there. We were sitting in Phil Spate's office one day and we were thinking, you know, if we let individuals keep nominating uh, BLM property for sale, we're not going to be able to plan what's happening out in that area. We got to do something. And uh, the county had a process, and I can't remember what they called it, but what was it? Do you remember, Andy? Limited transition, 
No, that's what we named it. They, so they had some name. So we sat around brainstorming, and we finally figured we'd call it the LTA, the Limited Transition Area. And, we, and I got to go back, and I testified before Congress, and we passed a bill that uh, enabled us to control, I don't remember, 335 acres, 400 acres, 500 acres, what, whatever it was. And, um, and, you know, we could see this would enable really planned and steady and the kind of controlled development. We weren't, don't, not control in terms of the pace, but to make sure things fit and work together out there. We weren't going to get the money. The money would go where the BLM money always goes. Uh, but we would have the right to do the planning. And I, I'm so thrilled with what has happened. I, I can't thank you guys enough for what has happened out there. And I had nothing to do with what has happened in recent years, but I did have an opportunity to play a part in it early on. And it's been, it's been that way in Henderson. We, we came along at a time when things were really going. I, I remember when we were for I don't remember how many years straight, like seven or eight years straight, the fastest growing city, over 100,000 population in the country by percentage. And uh, it was exciting. And I used to have arguments with the demographer. He'd, I'd meet with him about every six months, and he'd come in, and I'd say, all right, so what are we up to now? And he'd say, well, we're at 240. I said, 240 what? And he'd say, well, 243. Okay, I'm rounding that to 245. And then I'd go out, and I'd talk about Henderson. And, uh, we got perilously close to 300 before the economic downturn in 08. And so I bumped it to 300 just because it <laughs> made sense. We, we recruited businesses. We, it was important to us to bring jobs here. And I remember we were sitting around and we were saying, well, we, you know, we don't, wanna, we, we don't want to, to have issues with the Clark County School District, so we've got to be careful about how we do this. But I suggested maybe what we do is we create a presentation that showed these businesses the Henderson schools. Now, I have to admit, this is my, this is my repentance. I know they thought we were talking about a Henderson school district. I know they did. I never said that, not <laughs> once. But the performance in the Henderson schools was so remarkably strong that when we, when we put it all together, it was one of the finest school districts <laughs> anywhere. And we, we made a big deal out of that. And we had some, some really good successes that, that were more foundational. The things that have happened in recent years are the kind of things that you just dream about. And, but it was a thrill to be able to be a part of so many of those things. And we worked hard to, uh, and, and we work well together. You know, um, there was one time when the future of Henderson, in my mind, was hanging in the balance. And what had happened was the county employed a lobbyist back in D.C. that was really close to Senator Reed, and he was very effective with him. And uh, he'd gone back, and they'd written this lands bill, and we'd had a negotiation out here uh, in, in this valley, and there was supposed to be kind of a, an agreed-upon way that uh, we would expand the disposal boundary. That's the boundary within which sales can occur and outside of which sales could not occur on federal lands. And so we, you know, we, I was playing golf with the lobbyists. He, he came to town and invited me to play golf, and I, I had no idea what he'd done. But our manager and our attorney were being briefed at Senator Reed's office. So a, as we put our clubs in our trunks and drove off, I get a call from the manager, he said, you're not gonna believe this, but th the county has just unwound everything we negotiated. And it's in the bill, and the bill is gonna drop Wednesday, next week, that's what we think. And that's what we were told. So I said, well, meet me at my office. And we met at the office, and I called the senator on his cell phone. And um, if any of you saw that funeral, it, it was real. I mean, when you talk to the senator, when he was finished, he just hung up. And you didn't know if you'd said something wrong or what had happened, but that's how I handled it. In any case, we called him. And I said, Senator, the worst thing that I can even imagine, and, and by that I mean limiting the capacity of future councils to work with the BLM and grow 
as needed in order to keep this economy moving has just been stripped from the city of Henderson. What are you talking about? I said, it's the bill, the lands bill. And he, he was not happy, let me just put it that way. And uh, so he said, you'll be back here Tuesday, 9 a.m. in my office. I'll have Senator Ensign in this room, and we will have our key staff people, and we're going to get through this. And you bring whoever on your staff knows all the details, because this is the last chance you're going to have to talk about this thing. So I said, we'll be there. And we went back, and we sat down, and we helped them understand. There is still, by the way, some work to be done on that, because the county... Um, before I got there, started looking at it a little differently. But the land that goes all the way to Ivanpah, around the corner at Sloan, and all the way to Ivanpah was the land that was the subject of this, this negotiation. And it didn't matter to us so much that, that we could develop all of it. We just had to have a fair opportunity to expand around that corner when the time came. And we're getting there. So it, it's becoming important. So it, we thought it was important. So finally, we worked it out. He let us write new language, which was inserted in the bill. The bill dropped uh, Wednesday afternoon. That means it became an official bill of the United States Senate, and it passed. Now, in fairness, I have to say, the lobbyist in question had finished the bill, and he took his family to the Caribbean and was gone the whole time. And, um, and he's alive today yet. We've laughed about it. I guess the, the point is that each one of us has had an opportunity to, to contribute to the foundation. And none of us can claim that just because we're on third base we, means we hit a triple. We're on third base because others helped us get there. And that's, the, that's been the blessing of the continuity, the commitment to community, and the remarkable capacity that we have, you and we, all of us together, because it was all about bringing a community together and really working to the end that we accomplished the things that we felt would matter, we hoped would matter, we sensed would matter. And the things that he sensed would matter when Bob was serving mattered. And the things that I sensed, likewise, and so forth. And we're just proud. I'm as proud as I can be. And when I'm asked, is it more fun to be a county commissioner or to be the mayor? I always answer. <laughs> when you're a mayor, you're the mayor. When you're on the county commission, there are six other mayors. So <laughs> what do you think the answer to that question is? Thank you. For a name change to be a university, not just Nevada State College, but Nevada State University. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is the president of the Historical Society as well. We'll, we, we'll have to ask him later whether that's more fun than being mayor. <laughs> but uh, I think tonight we're going to hear about his time as mayor, Andy Hafen. All right, thank you. <clears throat> and I'm shamelessly going to plug the Henderson <laughs> Historical Society. Uh, you know, COVID has really hurt the society. We've, we've dropped from over 100 members down to about 50-ish. 50, 60 maybe. And so please, you in this room and any of your friends or families, uh, I'll make it really easy. <laughs> HendersonHistoricalSociety.org. Get on our website, upper right-hand corner, become a member or renew your membership or whatever. If you would do that, then we could continue to have these Henderson Speaks and uh, other things, our annual meetings and, and things. And uh, the biggest thing that we're trying to push, and, and I think everybody knows this, is we really want to turn that old fire station into kind of a, a, a meeting place for the historical society, for a place for memorabilia, for archives, and uh, we want to partner up with the city. Deborah's on board. I appreciate we've um, lobbied all the council members. Uh, I, all of them are behind it, so we want to just keep pushing that. We need your help, and thank you for coming. This is really great to see this number of people here finally after being on a hiatus for a year and seeing some of the familiar faces and the longtime residents, this is just really, it does our hearts really well. <clears throat> so I, I have to kind of add, and, and Bob, you may not remember this, but I, I'm sure he was the one that was really kind of involved with this. 
what they were going to call it was Lake at Las Vegas. This is after oh. Lake Adair. Lake at Las Vegas in Henderson. And I think that's when we just changed one little word, at, and Lake Las Vegas, and I think that was a big compromise. And so I, I, I think under that circumstance, it's a very, very nice uh, area that we can be proud of here in the city of Henderson. Uh, so the fellow, uh, fellow mayors, uh, things were going really great until 2006, 2007, and <laughs> we hit that great recession. And, Andy Hafen gets to be mayor in 2009. <laughs> a $90 million budget shortfall. That's what the a result of the uh, recession ended up. And it, so really, it, it, at first it wasn't all that fun, Mayor Gibson. It, it was really a challenge. And I, I will tell you that uh, the staff and uh, the, the, the workers, uh, the employees of the city of Henderson and, and the whole city came together and, and we got through that. And I could go in details, but uh, I don't think we really want to, if, 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 if questions come up to that, I can tell you some of the things that we did. So that was something to work through, th through the actual, the, the, almost the whole time that I was mayor. Uh, one of the, the things I can say that I'm proudest of, and again, it, it, it built on, our colleagues before us, uh, the parks. Uh, there was a time, <clears throat> and of course, Deborah was a council member at the time too. I swear, every single week, we were dedicating or ribbon cutting some kind of park here in the city of Henderson. And uh, we are known for, matter of fact, two times or maybe even three times, gold, gold national gold winners. Two gold medals. Twice. And finalist ones. Uh, in, in national, as far as uh, being. Um, recognized for our parks. So that, uh, I would have to say, was really kind of a, a highlight. <clears throat> One of the uh, uh, downfalls uh, or, or disappointments, probably is a better word, uh, you will all remember that uh, we were um, lobbied to build a soccer stadium in the city of Henderson, out by the, the, uh, the M. It wasn't part of this LTA that Jim talked about that now is so, so great. But <clears throat> we were warned that the person developing this was a little bit of a shyster. And so I, <clears throat> I thought it was a good idea. I think council thought it was a good idea. But uh, I, I said two things. Number one, <clears throat> excuse me, the city residents are not going to pay one dime of their tax dollars for the stadium. It, if you're going to develop it, you're going to have to develop it with your own money and, and not our residents' money. And then I knew the second thing that we needed to do was to have an agreement written that was locked tight because this person had actually, I think, fleeced the county out of some money, other, other states that he lived in. And so, of course, the end result was no soccer stadium was going to be built. In fact, he was trying to flip the land from a stadium to residential. And we found out about that, <clears throat> and we sued for a breach of contract. And after a, a, a lawsuit, we actually ended up making, I think we ended up with about $2 million mm -hmm. above and beyond what uh, he had spent and, and what the, the property was worth. <clears throat> so that did kind of have a, a real good ending as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things they, they asked us for maybe a humorous story, and so I'm gonna, <clears throat> I'm gonna tell this one. I won't use any names uh, of council members because it's a backstory of, of council members. But as Jim will remember, with our, our brand new city hall moving from the, the one uh, that was the jail and the police department and everything to this, this nice uh, uh, building where it's at now, <clears throat> there was an, an argument or a, a kind of a, 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 whatever you want to call it, a fight between a couple of council members who thought, so the mayor's office is here, and then there was four offices that were basically all exactly the same except for one was six inches wider than the rest. <laughs> and these two council members felt that they needed to have six the six, the larger, <laughs> the larger uh, office. <clears throat> and it was, I mean, it was really starting to, to be a, a brouhaha and staff was going, what the heck do we do? Council members are arguing over who gets what office and everything. So it was decided that uh, we would have a lottery. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> This is a backstory. True, true stuff, though. 
So here's how the lottery went. I don't even know you wouldn't have been there, Deborah, no. because I was still a council member, and GM said, well, "Miss Mayor, I'm not getting involved in that." I used to, <laughs> so, <laughs> so here's how the lottery went. We cut four pieces of paper, <laughs> numbered them one, two, three, four, and that's how the office numbers were going to be uh, noted. And we put the folded the papers in a basket, and we were going to draw. Well, <clears throat> I was the senior member on council, so it was decided that I would get to draw first. Now, the devil made me do this, and you're gonna probably think less of me, but when she held up the basket, it was right at eye level for me. <laughs> <laughs> and the papers were folded, but they had gone open like this. <laughs> I could see every single number. <laughs> The devil made me do it. I picked out the one with six inches more. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, that's probably a story that not too many people know. And please don't think of me less. <laughs> Things worked out good. after that because who cares? <laughs> uh -huh. so, and I don't even know how they do it now, Deborah. I guess as a council member leaves, you get to choose. I don't know. <laughs> so that was kind of a humorous thing. It kind of shows you a little bit of the, the back stuff going on with council members. <clears throat> um, I think what I'll do, uh, two stories, and then I'll, uh, for the time, uh, move on. I think one of the surprises that I had was I... What, I was a council member for 22 years before I became mayor. <clears throat> and it was like, Andy Haven, who? I swear, I got elected mayor, and two weeks later, I'm at Costco with Debbie. <clears throat> We're having a Costco hot dog. And <laughs> this young family is next to me, and the dad turns to me and goes, wow, it's not every day you get to have dinner with the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> 22 years I'm a council member, nobody knows who I was, and two weeks as a mayor. So the night notoriety was kind of interesting. And so I'll end with, I call this my, my bookend story, <clears throat> because I really enjoyed the eight years I, I was on uh, as I was mayor. <clears throat> and a couple of months just after being elected, they were having a career day at um, Taylor Elementary, fifth graders. <clears throat> so they asked if I wouldn't take you know, one of the sessions, and the kids would go from room to room, and so we talk about being mayor. Well, at the end <clears throat> of this one session, this one fifth grader came up to me, this little boy, and he goes, hey, can I have your autograph? <laughs> well, what the heck? <laughs> so I'm signing my name and look out of the corner of my eye, and there's this little fifth grade girl just kind of standing off to the side. And so as I finished signing my name, I looked to her, I said, do you want my autograph too? She said, no. <laughs> 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 okay, she said, I want a hug. <laughs> so I looked at the teacher. I mean, nowadays, who knows? And so she gave me a nod of approval. And this fifth grader came up and gave me this hug like nobody's business. And it'd be, so that was what? Like 13 years ago now or whatever. It'd be interesting to see what happened to her. So that was right after <clears throat> being elected. And then just a few months uh, before uh, being termed, uh, we were doing Nevada re Reading Week, and interesting enough, I, I did love doing that, and I was actually at Lorna Kesterson Elementary reading to the students. <clears throat> and I actually, I did a lot of that. I think my record for, for one uh, year was I, I read at 22 elementary schools. Oh. I really did enjoy doing that, yeah. <clears throat> but, so that was in the morning, and in the afternoon, I get this email from one of the students' mother. And she said, Mayor Hafen, I don't know what you did, what you said, but my third grade son came home from school, <clears throat> and he must have Googled my name or something, and he was on his little iPad or screen or watch it. And I think it was because you could Google, you know, Andy Hafen, uh, Mayor, and, and our state of the cities. I think they still are on, on YouTube. Well, he starts watching my state of the city, and his mom's just kind of watching, and <clears throat> she goes, then he turns to me and he goes, Mommy, when I grow up, I want to be a mayor. Oh. <laughs> and so the, the beginning and the end, so yes, it, it was a, a great eight years. And so I'll end with that and entertain any kind of uh, <clears throat> questions you have. And of course, we have our current mayor, and, and I'm happy to say 
not the first female mayor <laughs> of the city. That's, that's something that's very nice about Henderson, but our current mayor, Deborah thank, Marsh. Thank you very much, Mark. And what a pleasure it is to be here tonight. And thank you to each and every one of you who've come out, especially during COVID and the challenges we all have uh, in our own homes and in our community to, to be able to make the evening with us a little more special. I am really grateful to be able to stand on the shoulders of great people who've, who've made a difference and really laid a foundation for the wonderful community that we live in here in Henderson. And uh, I think about the, the things that, that matter to me and matter to us in the community. And I think about the, those that came before and the impact that they made and the things that matter to them. And I, I look at, for, for me personally, I, I ran the Real Estate Institute at UNLV for 15 years and then uh, was a planning commissioner under Andy Hafen. Andy actually appointed me and asked me to, to serve. And I served for six years as his planning commissioner. And as uh, the director of the Real Estate Institute at UNLV, planning and land use and real estate were important priorities for the program and for me. And so when I came over to the city of Henderson and saw the great work that had been done foundationally <coughs> and, and how consistently there was always good planning and very thoughtful and deliberate decisions that were made, whether it was about parks and trails and quality of life and uh, neighborhoods and community. Uh, everything that was done previously has been very deliberate and thoughtful. And uh, so when, when I had the opportunity to then uh, pursue city council, Andy was elected mayor and uh, the seat came open and I actually competed against 17 men oh and gosh. I was selected. It, it was just, I was moved. <laughs> to be selected. It was really pretty amazing. Um, and I think a lot of it had to do with the background that I had in real estate and land use and economic development and diversification because those are important things that a council person and a mayor are involved in because you're, you're building your community and you're, you're doing so much foundational work. And again, I, I give great credit to the folks who, who really led the way and, and laid that foundation because you look at other cities across the country and how they do business and, and you don't always see the most deliberate of planning and land use decisions that have been made and, and even quality community. Like Henderson has a strategic plan uh, that really calls out for us to be America's premier community. And, and that's something that we're deliberate about. And, and that's the message that we share to, the, to those who are looking at places to live, work, and play, that quality of life is very important to us. And to that end, uh, I take great pride in the fact that we've been designated the second safest community in America. I think that's really important uh, because what I've found is if businesses and industries want to relocate and if families want to relocate, they want to know that they're moving to a safe place. And, and I think Henderson has been deliberate about being a safe place. One of the priorities that I took on when I was uh, first appointed to council and then still as, as mayor was the redevelopment efforts in downtown Henderson. And uh, I remember when I first uh, got on the council and I was talking about how we should redevelop the downtown area and people would say to me, it's impossible because you have a jail and a courthouse down there so you can't possibly redevelop because no one will want to be down there. And we had this uh, uh, older convention center that really, I think we patched the roof probably 150 <laughs> times. I mean, it was, it was in pretty serious shape. And, the transformation that you see now on Water Street really is so vibrant, and I think we had a couple of projects, uh, both residential in nature and also Lifeguard Arena, that were, were really catalyst projects that have brought a whole new energy into the downtown area. And, and I guess that what, one of the things that I would um, say is that have a plan and work that plan. And, I, and I've been very deliberate about that, uh, knowing the good work that came before, um, that, that as we plan for community and we plan for our future, let's work that plan. That's not to say that we, we aren't going to be flexible and, and when there's times that we need to, to adjust and maybe move in a little bit different direction. But I've found that 
you can achieve your goals when you set those goals and you continue to work at them and, and you stay on course. And um, one of the other areas that I've focused on is economic development and diversification and bringing businesses and industries to our community, not just any business or industry, but industries that will help us to strengthen our economy, that will offer uh, good paying salaries where people can afford to live, work, and play in our community. And in fact, um, in 2017, I was on a roundtable with Michael Bloomberg in, in Detroit. It was uh, the City Lab project in Detroit. And Michael Bloomberg said to us, he said, you know, we, you need to make sure that you're, you're going after jobs of the future, jobs that uh, will sustain your community long after you're gone. And, and so I started to look at advanced manufacturing and, and jobs where we have technology and jobs that pay better. And so I worked uh, tirelessly to, to attract companies like Haas Automation. Haas is bringing 2,500 jobs to our community at 65,000 a year or better. Those are jobs of the future, the jobs that'll be here in Henderson long after we're gone. Google, who's bringing in 250 jobs at 65,000 a year or better. And there's FedEx and um, Safe Life Defense and so many other companies that are choosing Henderson as a place to do business. But we want to make sure that they're good paying jobs where folks don't have to uh, live somewhere else and drive into Henderson, that they can afford to purchase a home and be a part of our community and, and uh, celebrate. So, so men, much of this work, I, I guess I call it a 30 year overnight success. Good planning by my predecessors and, and good planning going forward. Great team to work with a great team. There's some other great projects that are on, on the books for the future. We're looking at reimagining the Boulder Highway. We've got a, a project that will look at um, traffic calming, and it'll have center running transit and two lanes of traffic, and then a separated bike lane on the sides. And, and it'll just make it a safer uh, corridor. It, unfortunately, Boulder Highway has more road deaths than any highway or any roadway in the state of Nevada. We definitely have to find solutions. And, I, and now that we have a new county commission chair, <laughs> my hope is that we can continue this project north into the county and then up into the city as well. Um, there's a lot of other things that, that I'm especially proud of. We are, in, uh, since I've been mayor, we're building our third fire station. We're building a new police station. We're building a workforce training facility in West Henderson where we're going to be training folks to work for companies like Google or Haas Automation. And we're in partnership with the College of Southern Nevada to, to provide the training program for this uh, workforce training facility that'll actually be located uh, adjacent to the Haas Automation facility. And we're actually building a new crime lab. And our crime lab, I think, had a leaky ceiling. And we had some real challenges around our crime lab. And so we're excited to, to see this investment. And I, and I believe we've uh, bonded up to about a hundred million, Nick. Uh, so we're actually be able to do a number of projects, including a partnership with the Golden Knights to build the uh, dollar loan facility. Um, that's actually a partnership, but at the same time, the city of Henderson owns that facility. I know folks have have questioned about the facility whether it was. Uh, something we were giving to, to the Knights. We're not, we own that facility. It will be the city's facility uh, in perpetuity, but we have a partnership and a lease agreement with the Golden Knights to, and the Silver Knights to be able to, to uh, perform in that facility. But also, we're gonna have high school and college graduations. The Henderson Symphony Orchestra will be performing there and a number of events. So this is truly a community facility that replaced the pavilion. And there's so many other things that I could share with you that we're working on. We, we uh, actually have got a, uh, made education an important priority in the city of Henderson as, as uh, Commissioner Gibson, Mayor Gibson shared, you know, that, that education has and continues to be an important priority in Henderson. And uh, we actually have, in the last uh, five years, given $9 million to the Clark County School District to enhance the quality of education, to provide programs and services to uh, our schools and to our educators and to early childhood education because we know how important our children are in our community. And we it's up our responsibility to ensure that we lay a foundation for them and ensure a bright future for all of our, our community members. Um, I think what I'll do is maybe just turn it back over to you, Mark, because I could probably go okay. on for a while, but I, I think I'll give it to you and then... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm... Uh, 
serve as your mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Sean, if you would. Um, I'm going to take the opportunity to tell one story. I think it's because my feet hurt so badly. I spent all day at the SHOT Show today. Oh. Walked the grounds there. If anybody's gone to the SHOT Show, you know what it's like to walk through that. But Bob, your comment about Green Valley and the whole name thing. I moved over here in 1993. I moved into Green Valley. I remember all of that, listening to it. I have a thing about names. Anybody that knows my book knows that. Um, but what I remember is driving around, I would listen sometimes to a, a uh, talk show from a gun shop on Boulder Highway. And this gun shop had an interesting style and they would talk about the folks in Green Valley. And they said, okay, these guys want a different name. So let's call them what they really are. And they would always say, so we're going to call them what they really are, West Pittman. <laughs> <laughs> and they always referred to Green Valley as West Pittman whenever they were talking about that. And that was back in 94, 95. So <laughs> that was what I remember of, of you know, this, this show, this talk show on the radio is always West Pittman this, West Pittman that, yeah, which I thought was quite, quite humorous. So if we have any, any questions or comments, please raise your hand and uh, make sure that Sean runs a lot. That would be, <laughs> that would be good. Um, any questions? Oh, come now. I'm sure there's one out there. Yes, there we go. Keep them running. This is for uh, Mayor Hafen. <laughs> no, it's more of a serious, no, it's a happy one. You uh, served through a very difficult time. What event or time kind of made you aware that you had gotten through it? Mm. Well, I, <clears throat> actually, I, I think I can tell you. Um, you know, with, with all the things that we kind of put in place, uh, one of the things that probably hurt the most is we did a 5% budget cut across all departments. And that, that didn't hurt too much. Then we asked for another 5%. That started to hurt. Then we said, we want 5% more. And that really hurt. But everybody, you know, all the departments got together, worked that out. Um, one of the innovative things that we did uh, was uh, we had $10 million in reserves during this kind of recession type thing. And so we came up with the idea that we would buy um, longtime employees out. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, oh, I know government, that never works. You buy them out and then you hire people back in. What's... But we went ahead and did it. And believe it or not, we didn't backfill but maybe one or two of those positions. And I remember, and correct me, Deborah, you were there. We were saving $500,000 a payroll. So with 26 payrolls, that's $13 million that we saved. We didn't backfill them. And then finally, towards the end, you know, things opened up. We were able to start getting uh, employees back. And it's, it's interesting. To, Jim talks about, you know, we wanted those population numbers because Basically, part of our revenue <laughs> was based on your population and your population growth. So yes, come on, get that thing up as much as you can. But uh, yeah, that I think once we got through that, then I could settle back and figure, well, you know, um, I've, I've made it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Good yeah. Good. <clears throat> Anyone else? First of all, thank you everybody, all the mayors from uh, past and current. We certainly appreciate all that you've done, a lot of, not without a lot of sacrifice. This question, there's two questions. One to Jim Gibson, did the statute of limitations run on uh, the mayor for, for taking that number one out of the basket? And uh, Yes. Number two is for Bob. Bob. Bob, what are some of your, maybe there's one or two, of your uh, low times as the mayor and high times? Well, I don't, I don't know if I'd call a low, a low time. 
there are plenty of low times, don't get me wrong. Um, not so much with the city. I think as a mayor, I think the thing that I was most disappointed with after I left was the spring training facility not coming to fruition. Um, that was a project I, you know, what the council spent about four years on. We secured the property. We secured the grants from the Convention of Visitors Authority. I don't know how many trips I took to Texas and Chicago and um, working with the owners of the, of the teams. And it, it was just a fabulous project that I, I thought was the right time for the community and for, for all of Southern Nevada. And I, I thought, you know, today it probably would have brought, it would have been hundreds of millions of dollars into the community. It was really a unique thing, unique thing and, it, and it didn't happen. And I didn't have any control over that when I left. And, you know, it was a very competitive process. And my good friend Jan Jones, who was the mayor at the time in Vegas, of course, was jockeying hard for that, for that opportunity in the city. Unfortunately, it didn't work out for them either. So, but I think we all lost in Southern Nevada. Now, I'm very pleased, though. I mean, fast forward to today. I mean, we've got significant hockey facilities here in town. We've got the Golden Knights in Vegas. We've got a pro football team. I mean, things have really, you know, you know, turned in the right direction. But that was just something I, you know, that stands out for me. It's something I didn't get completed um, that really meant a lot, not to me personally, but I, I think for the community. Mm -hmm. Hi. Thank you guys all for being here. Um, Sorry for you guys, but this is more of a what's going on right now kind of situation. Um, as a product of Nevada education, um, we always joked when I went to Green Valley High, or I guess West Pittman High, um, we always joked about being 50 out of 50 in the nation for education. And, you know, um, with the money that's been being fed into the school system, and I do know that we've not been 50, for a few years now. 48, I think. <laughs> hey, baby steps. Um, have we seen an increase in the state's test scores or have we seen any quantitative data showing that we're improving? I think the, uh, the schools in Henderson and in Summerlin, I believe, tend to perform at a higher level than schools throughout the district. Um, I was reading a study recently that was done by Lindsay uh, Institute at UNLV in Brookings, and they talked about school district size and how it can really impact uh, outcomes for students. And we actually have the fifth largest district, I believe, in the country. And, uh, you know, there really continues to be conversations about what the optimal size of a school district should be and, and how we can better get better outcomes for our children. Obviously, we want our children to, to choose Nevada, choose Southern Nevada as a place to raise their families, but if, uh, if the education system isn't performing for them, then they're gonna be looking at other places. So we have to look for solutions. And I know in, uh, during Mayor Hafen's time, I think you sat on a, a committee that looked at how we could have better involvement with families and in the community and engage the community in better outcomes. And I think we had some progress with that for a period of time. And we have actually at the city of Henderson have a, a group called the CAB, which is a community education advisory board that provides input to uh, the city of Henderson um, on best ways to spend the resources that we have as a city. In fact, in Henderson, we spend, I think, a, th a third of the revenue from marijuana sales we, we direct that to education, and then we also, I believe, 18% set aside of the redevelopment dollars is spent on education as well. So we, we know how important that is. Henderson has long recognized that my, my predecessors have long valued education in our community, and I think that there's probably going to be some serious discussions going forward in the next uh, several years to, to try to solve these challenges, to look at what we can do better to serve the children in our state. That we want them to stay here. We want them to get a great education and to, to uh, be successful in business and industry. And we're doing things from the standpoint of um, supporting the colleges and the universities and, and supporting workforce training. So there's things that we're doing, but I know that, that uh, pre-K through 12 is so critical for these kids as well. 
right over here. Thank you all. It was great listening to all of you. I've only lived here since 54, so I'm one of those newcomers. <laughs> but I wondered what, um, how those water shortage is impacting the future growth and what, how are you dealing with that? Yeah, and I think, Jim, you're on the Water Authority Board. And I know there's a lot being done to look at conservation measures. I think that the takeaway that really makes sense is that it's not so much that, we, that the population can't grow or that homes can't be built. It's that the use of water outdoors where it can evaporate and we lose it um, is a real challenge. We, we are already living kind of a toilet to tap life. Uh, it's, it's diluted a lot by the water that comes down the Colorado. But uh, our challenge is we've got, to, we've got to stop some of the things that have become commonplace. You go to a big building, a, a warehouse, an industrial building, uh, even a grocery store, and you see there the cooling towers throughout back. We've seen these things for forever. But a cooling tower um, loses so much water because of the evaporation. I mean, it's an evaporative cooling asset, and we can't allow those any longer. In fact, although we're not to the point where we've adopted an ordinance, the Southern Nevada Water Authority is producing um, ordinances that will be brought back. It'll be the same in each case. All of us have to be on the same page. But we'll be, we'll be saying you cannot ever again build another cooling tower. We'll be incentivizing people that have them to replace them with, with some sort of mechanical cooling where that is feasible. It may not be feasible everywhere, but what we've learned is that there in Arizona, there are a couple of places, including a data center, which is a very high water consumptive use, um, where they've used mechanical cooling, more like what you have on the top of your house or out in your yard with an air handler. Um, that is something that, is, that we've got to do. Um, when it comes to stopping growth, um, Boulder City gets to do that. I, I don't know that any, you know whether you all would like that or you wouldn't like it. That's that's really not the point. Because of the way Boulder City is funded, Boulder City has 121 or whatever the number is building permits a year that they issue. Um, but the rest of us are dependent upon uh, dollars that come from growth to fund government. And so we're going to continue. There will be uh, modest, but before long, it will be not so modest, uh, things that we'll do. I, for instance, today, you can buy a home, a, mo a, a, a home in a, in a subdivision. And uh, there are lots of them going up. There's no grass in a single front yard in a new home today. But you can have lawn, you can have turf in the backyard. That will no longer be the case. There will not be allowed turf to be built, uh, to be planted, front yard or backyard. Um, the size of swimming pools will be restricted. The current proposal is to 600 square feet. Um, those are some of the things that we're doing and the sacrifices that are going to be required of us. You know, for my part, I, I wish there were other things that we could do. I'll tell you one of the things that we have done that is away from us just sacrificing more. We have a $3.2 billion project that would build a new South Valley lateral. That's really important to Henderson because there's a 20-year-old pipe uh, that doesn't have a backup pipe. There's no redundancy. It's the only lateral that we have that comes in from our water treatment facilities and from the lake that is not backed up. And so we've got to build that. But as a part of that financing, uh, the Metropolitan Water District in Los Angeles contacted us and offered us that if we would contribute uh, some percentage, I think a third, of the cost of them building what we here call a reuse plant, and that is you know, water that is maybe non-contact water, they use it on golf courses. Uh, I think it's really, I think the technology is such you could use it on parks, I don't think we do. But the bottom line is that the, in California they've been polishing their water to a degree, and then they, putting it in, they put it in a pipe and it goes out a couple miles and then they release it into the ocean. And that's, that's a waste of water, and it, it particularly it affects the Colorado 
demand, the demand on the Colorado River. So what they've agreed is to sell us effectively 25 to 35 thousand acre feet of water. It'll be the first time in history since the dam was built that we will have been able to increase the acre footage that we can remove from, uh, from the lake. And that's a big deal. And there are other opportunities. There are some new technologies that are remarkable. I've actually witnessed some things that, that we just wouldn't believe. And those technologies um, are here. They're, they're producing here. It, it isn't unique to here, but for some reason they've ended up here. And so a relationship between the Water Authority and them as we promote that kind of stuff in California in exchange for additional water out of the Colorado system. Colorado River is, you know, huge for us. It's way big for them. And we get 300,000 acre feet. They get 4.6 or 8 million acre feet in California, a couple of million fewer than that in Arizona. And we're the most dependent in terms of a percentage of what happens here on the Colorado than, than anyone. So there are things that we're doing, we're working on, but there are some immediate things that will happen. And Jim, isn't it that we're only, we only get about 1%, uh, 1.5% of the water that comes down the Colorado River, and that we actually are using less water today than we were 15 years ago? That's right. So our conservation efforts flattened out the last couple of years, and we need to double down. You know, we've replaced a lot of turf. I think it's $3 a square foot that you can get if you remove it. We removed it. My wife found out about that uh, before I could get home, and she had my son on a backhoe digging up my grass <laughs> before I could get a picture of it oh, and no. invite the water authority out to inspect it. So <laughs> we replaced our grass. Uh, but the, the bottom line is that we've got to be aggressive. We'll continue to be aggressive, and, and we feel that with the changes that we've talked about that we can still count on there being water in our 50-year resource plan to accommodate the plans that we see around the community. You know, uh, <clears throat> some of you will, will remember Kurt Sagler. He was our uh, water department uh, director. <clears throat> and he said something to me one time that uh, really struck. Um, you know, he said, Andy, we'll never run out of water. And, and I'm not trying to minimize the, the drought and the Colorado River. He said, we will have as much water to grow as much as we want. The limiting factor is how much do you want to pay for that? And so that's really kind of the policy decision overall, looking at 60,000 foot level is, what is gonna be the tripping point where, you know, I'm, I'm just not, I'm, it's, I don't have the stomach to pay that much for, for water uh, to, to live here, because growth is so important to us. And that's gonna be the decision. I don't know if our, any of us here are gonna to have to make that final decision, but eventually somebody's gonna to have to make the decision how much is too much. I think that's what it boils down to. So when I hear we're running out of water, I, I tend to believe what Kurt said. I mean, there's plenty of, of, of water. I mean, look at the ocean. If you, if you really wanna get crazy or, or look at the Columbia River, or you look at the Mississippi that floods, it's how much do we want to pay to get that water here? Got a question in the back. Run! Run! There you go. <laughs> Hi, this is for Deborah March, current mayor. Uh, since this is a historical society meeting, <laughs> throughout history of this town, we've had a celebration every year to celebrate the heritage of this town. I know because of the pandemic and everything else that's happened, it's been put off and put off. And, do you see that coming back, and how are you going to unite a town that's as big as Henderson now with so many different areas of Henderson? How are we going to come together and again and celebrate? You know, I, I would like to see it come back. In fact, I, I uh, really pushed for the renaming back to the industrial days because I felt like it really honored our, our history and our heritage. Um, I, I think that right now, given the, the circumstances of the pandemic, we probably won't... Uh, be having an event this year, but 
I think in the future, uh, my hope would be that they would continue to have it. There are other events that, that we have had that have brought the community together that's actually pretty exciting. Um, we had an event at the, uh, at the adjacent to the arena, we have the plaza, and we actually had, I think, 3,000 people out on the plaza watching Coco with the Henderson Symphony Orchestra playing. The, if, you, if you stay tuned to some of the things that are happening in and around city of Henderson, there's a lot actually going on that is an opportunity to bring people together. And um, to me, I think it's important for us to celebrate community, and that's what makes Henderson so unique, that we, we do celebrate quality of life. We still have that small town feel, even though we are a city, we're actually in the top 100 cities by size. Uh, but that isn't the feel you get when you come into the city of Henderson. There's really quality community. People care for one another. They look out for one another. And truly, I, I would, that's something I would love to see happen. I don't, I don't think it's going to happen this year because of the pandemic and the circumstances around it. But hopefully in the future, we'll, we'll continue to see events like, uh, like the Industrial Days. And, and I, I know we didn't have our Christmas parade, which we usually have, which is um, an evening parade. So there's a lot of things that, that we'd like to get back to. I think when circumstances change, we certainly will. Isn't um, St. Patrick's Day happening? Uh, is I it happening? I, I think uh, it is. It is. Okay. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Right. yeah. I think it is happening. I think we shut down two years ago on St. Yeah. Patrick's Day. That was the, the event we had, the first event that we and canceled. canceled. Yeah. yeah. But the last thing I saw, it was happening this year. Mm -hmm. Well, so. let's hope it. Yeah, I hope continues. so. Yeah. So, so could I just mark, uh, oh, kind of tag onto that? That's a, it's a good question. It reminds me of something that happened that was kind of fun. Um, there were those who believed that the name of the parade was changed by the city, when in fact the parade was owned by the chamber. Oh. And the chamber felt that it was really important to dress up uh, the name of the parade for their reasons. <clears throat> In any case, we had a lot of back and forth with them, but we could never carry the day. So um, the word kind of got out, and I, I don't know what the word was, but um, my assistant had arranged a, a car for me to sit on, and my wife was going to sit on it with me in a convertible, and we were going to ride down Water Street. And uh, the police came up to us and said, there will be uh, six or eight of us, and we'll be walking uh, in plain clothes, you know, kind of around you, because when you get down to the Steelworkers Hall, they threatened. Uh, we, we feel there's a live threat there. And I looked at them, I, you've got to be kidding me. And so it was about the naming they said. So I said, I'm, I'm going anyway. I didn't name, I didn't rename it, I'm going. So we, we went down the road and there were a group of people as there always are at the, at the union hall. And when we got down there, um, on cue, this is what they did, how horrible a thing they did. They counted to three and they turned around <laughs> And the back of the shirt said something like, industrial days, not heritage days. <laughs> <That> was, <laughs> but I was, you know, I was safe, that's for sure. <laughs> Boy, were they mean. <laughs> well, let, 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 me, let me just add to that. I, I think that was Kenny that made that comment back there. I, why can't we have the parade? I, and, and why can't it be industrial days? I, enough of this mask nonsense. Um, when are we going to get back to the light? So, yeah, I, I hear that every day. I think people, you know, we, we listen to science, but we yeah, don't know. I'm tired of listening to science. Yeah, no. I, I want to, I think I, we need to start living our lives. People can choose whether they want to come to the event. It's outdoors. Yeah. You just mentioned you host an event for 3,000 people on the, on the quad, which is fantastic. I just think it's time that we... I get back to life, and yeah, I agree. I've said for years, and Jim, I actually think we changed that when I was in office, or maybe it was right when you came in the name. Well, we didn't change it, like you said. Yeah, I got a lot of nasty calls, too, and oh, no, I'm sorry, a place to call home. That's one we dealt with, Andy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, it was, uh, yeah, Amanda Cyphers, and, and look, I give Amanda a lot of credit. She was really trying to do the right thing, and, and, it, and it stuck, and but I, again, I'm a firm believer in, in recognizing our heritage, where we came from, who we are, mm -hmm. what this city is, um, you know, our past and our future. 
and I'm just a strong advocate. I'm sick and tired of being closed in and uh, listening to these clowns on TV tell me about science. It's time to live our lives, and this is a great city, and let's, let's start living again. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think we, we have to learn to live with, this is going to be a part of our lives going yep. forward, and we're going to have to learn to live with it. So. Oh, yeah. Any other questions? Ah, one over here. Um, I was not born and raised here. Okay. I uh, come from a place a little further west on the coast. And um, we came down here in 2004. And um, went through the whole thing with the 2008 stuff. And um, the mayor's... Uh, Mayor Gibson, the only reason I know about you is there's a library named after you, and there's street. <laughs> okay, and I drive down that, so it's a really a pleasure to uh, hear you tonight, and uh, your your really your love for the city, and also for you, sir, who I know nothing about, but it was really <laughs> nice. Okay. It was really good to to hear. Now I've had an opportunity to meet Mayor Hafen and. Uh, Mayor March, so you, you are my two guys. And um, what was really fun for me when we came down was that this is a community. And what really impressed me, because as I said, I'm from a West Coast city. I was born and raised in San Francisco, and I'm very proud of that. And what I like about y'all is that no matter what, you have remained what I would call nonpartisan. And you have focused on the good of the community. And so to be able to meet you, you know, listen to you this evening, share your heritage and about this, the, the community, your hometown, has been really, really a pleasure for me and I appreciate it very much. And the things that you all do really benefit Henderson and make it a community that, that is, is priceless, really. It's just a very good place to be, and I'm glad that I had the opportunity to be here, but to also at least get to hear four of you tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you very much, Lynn. And, and I would just like to share that I, you know, having run for office and then having served and served through a pandemic, I know what it takes to, the sacrifice that it takes to run for an office, and then also the sacrifice of serving for as many years as each of you have served. And I know that it, in this community, it's very personal for the folks who have served in Henderson, that this is a community that they grew up in, they love. Um, I didn't grow up here, but I love this city. And I, I know what all of these gentlemen have done to, to uh, give back to the community and to uh, give selflessly. And I, I, I'm in awe to be able to sit at the table with them as well. All righty, well, I think that's, that's it for tonight. Let's thank our panel. Let's thank the mayors for being here. We're busy individuals. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, thank you, Mark.